Kim, I'll pass it over to you to get started. Go for it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Hello, hello, and welcome to Soft Ed's webinar, uh, the sponsor here for me. And uh, uh, we're, we're definitely delighted that all of you have been able to join us, and uh, we're ready to tell you everything you ever wanted to know. No, we don't have enough time for that. So we're going to we're going to uh, hopefully talk about some future classes. Uh, and Dave has already mentioned uh, uh, Mark uh, uh, Balser's class is in November and uh, it's in the slides. And so you can go to Soft Ed and register for that if you know, want to know more about um, uh, business analysis and uh, and uh, project management and how it's being used in in um, uh, this group. So let's start off by talking about um, uh, what are our objectives. So one of the things we're gonna to try to do is attempt, because we just don't have enough time, a comprehensive understanding of AI. And uh, there's a, a few words that come to mind and one of them is data, 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 and data. Um, so we're gonna give some insights into AI's history we're also going to talk about where AI has being used and where it can benefit the, the business, right? And we're going to look into some possibilities of AI, where it's going. Uh, we're going to look a little bit into the workforce and how it's going to impact the workforce. And what are the limitations of AI? Um, I wanted to share with you um, a little bit about my personal story. Um, because uh, it, it says a lot about where AI has come from. Um, I started uh, finding out a little bit about it in 1973. I found a, a program, interestingly enough, on a teletype. And it was called uh, ELIZA, E-L-I-Z-A. And uh, I found out that that was uh, something that was uh, done in the 70s. Or, I'm sorry, not in 70. I found it in 73. It was actually done in about 59. And... Uh, the way it worked is was pretty simple. Uh, it says, "Who are you?" and you gave it your name, and then it says, uh, "Tell me, tell me more." And so, tell me about yourself. And so you'd write a few sentences, and then it would say, "Well, tell me more about it. That's interesting about." And it would pick something out and say, "Tell me more about that." And so you would go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it, what I found out was it was building a database, and in that database, it was making relationships between two different words it was using whole words in the database base and then it was also um it was also then making a a piece to piece uh probability that, that these words would come in contact with each other in a later sentence and it could actually come back and using uh, some conjunctive words like and and the and of and it would even uh, record those um, it would build something that looked like it was intelligence. It looked like it was intelligence. And it was fascinating because for the first time I saw computers, which is, you know, where my love was, as the possibility that there was some going to be some intelligence. Well, now it's 50 years later, 50 years later, and we're using what's called the large language models uh, for open AI's, AI's uh, chat GPT and some of the others that are there. And so what it provides now is it's the model itself is already built. It doesn't have to build it uh, as we go. And it's the internet. So it's a huge model. Uh, somebody said it was like 1.5 petabytes of information. Um, and, uh, and we also have bigger and faster machines. And so we can mathematically enhance the uh, predictability and also the statistical uh, probability that these things will come out. So it makes it even look more like it's intelligent, right? So, but the dis difference again is that we have faster machines now and we have larger, much larger, uh, the entire internet base of information, right? And all we're doing is we're just tagging those words and the probabilities. And we can use that again and again. The big key here is fast and big. So what will What's going to happen in uh, for future AI? Well, um, I have to go back to what David started out with, uh, not in this seminar, but in the other one that we talked about, uh, where it's about change, you know, and change is going to happen, and it is happening, and it's kind of 
this change for between AR, AI and um, and uh, uh, what we've been used to in programming machines, um, it's getting to the point now, it's kind of scary, but uh, we see computers programming computers. And uh, this is where we're going. The biggest issue that I find is that, like making in this presentation of, um, I'll admit I used um, uh, AI to make the presentation, which I thought was great. But then I started looking into all the little pieces that were there and found out, wow, there were a lot of mistakes. And a lot of companies had moved on and a lot of companies had changed their website and it's changed, changed, changed. So what is it that we see that's going to happen here in the future? Well, it's going to be finding mistakes, finding mistakes. And then the other part that really disturbs me, uh, I don't know about you, but disturbs me is that uh, people say, oh, I found this in the Internet. And everybody goes, okay. How do you know that what you found in the Internet is true? So truth detection, right, is becoming that new profession. Um, and also as a, as a kind of a backdrop here, I just wanted to share with you a book. This is the book. I'm showing it up on my screen here. I Hopefully you can see it. Uh, Bostrom wrote a book. Uh, from Oxford Press called uh, Super Intelligence. And uh, this book has been recommended by Bill Gates. And I thought, well, oh, okay, well, I'm going to have to read that. But the more that I read, the more that I read, the more notes I made in the side pieces. And I went, you know what? I need to write a book. <laughs> so I am. But this is a, this is a good book if you want to be challenged with where AI is and where it's going. Um, Here's another interesting book. I just happened to have these on my, my bookshelf and read. This one is the scary one it's called The Singularity, right? And, and the end of the world is near because of AI. Uh, this was written in uh, 2005. Uh, the super intelligence book, uh, Nick Bostrom, by the way, is a professor at Oxford, and he actually has a class in AI. And so this is basically notes from his class. Um, this was written in 2000 and 2014. So what is it? Well, uh, it's the technologies. It's all of the things that uh, make it look like it's intelligent. Um, we say artificial intelligence because it's not really intelligent, is it? Um, and uh, what it is not. So I'm dismayed when I hear, oh, it's got AI, oh, it's got AI, oh, it's got AI, only to find out that it's a marketing term. Um, AI is real, but we have to kind of divorce ourselves from all of the things that, that it is not. And it's not something that just has a circuit board or microprocessor in it. So be careful. Um, some of the key tasks um that ai actually does problem solving it does some problem solving um sometimes you need a little bit of uh, reasoning as it says here um human interaction has to come into play there uh you can't really solve problems or the ai can't solve problems it needs a little bit of help uh currently so you know we're looking at futures later uh Perception, natural language understanding. I find it uh, find it amazing we don't give credit for AI being able to use it for translators um, from different languages. Um, and I play uh, uh, an online game, which I don't know some of you also do, but uh, that's worldwide. And the chats that are in there are any language. So um, I'm translating and, and talking to people in uh, um in Arabic, and I'm looking at Arabic language, I see that and I hit the translate button and it translates it and it's a fascinating, fascinating that it can do that. So uh, this is what AI is uh, today. So let's look a little bit at the timeline, the history of it. Um, uh, some could say, well, it doesn't matter what the history was, but in our case, uh, the, the ancient civilizations, uh, actually had something that they they saw the gods or whatever. But uh, uh, as we started getting the mechanical age, uh, we had uh, automata, 
Uh, we had these little robots that uh, did things and uh, the cuckoo clock, right? Um, but uh, uh, and Disney's um, automation that they do inside of there uh, pretty much is mechanical, but they're in, in currently doesn't have a lot of artificial intelligence with it. That'll, that'll change too. Entertainment will change dramatically. Um, if you want to uh, t take a real deep dive into some of the early foundations of, of AI, you want to look at the Henry Miller Day, M-I-A-L-L-A-R-D-E-T, uh, called a draftsman writer, and it was a robot. They actually made a, a movie about this, and I've watched it several times. Fascinating, where the the mechanical device uh, automata right goes, and it can write on a piece of paper with with ink and a piece of paper, and uh, it can change by a program that's done in the back. So, uh, for, uh, again, made it look like it was intelligent. Right? The Dartmouth Workshop. So the Dartmouth Workshop was in 1956, and uh, several fellows, and I won't go into uh, the names and whatnot, organized it. And uh, their their charter was an attempt to be to find out how to make machines to use language, form abstractions and concepts, and solve problems now reserved for humans, and improve themselves. This was the first time that the word supposedly was, was coined artificial intelligence. So the Dartmouth workshop is the beginnings of that. Um, there was a lot of excitement about that happening and they spent some time working on that particular aspect of it. Um, unfortunately, um, our computers were just not up to the task. Um, I mean, the PC didn't come around until about 82. And uh, so these very, very large machines, they, they were very excited about it. A lot of money was poured into um, artificial intelligence uh, in those early years to try and make it. And actually computers themselves, uh, the challenge was always to make it better, better, better. Um, and then it wasn't until probably um, um, the, the 90s to present uh, when we actually were able to have machines that were powerful enough and that we had um, uh, uh, the rise of the internet and the capability to, to have large pieces of information that we could, could look at and we could grab together. Um, and, uh, but because of the AI winners and some of the people uh, being disenfranchised with where AI was going, uh, the money really wasn't there. I mean, we said AI and people went, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not putting any money in that. Uh, all of a sudden, they started using s some statistical analysis, and we'll look at some of the places where you can go do a deeper dive into that uh, later. But they called it deep, they changed the name. They called it deep learning. And everybody went, oh, this is something new, deep learning. We're going to have to have to get out the money and let's put some more money in it. And, and it's been very successful, been very successful to the point where we've had some uh, current AI systems and uh, IBM's Watson was uh, was promoted very heavily early on. And everybody, well, yeah, but we can't buy them big IBM machines. And uh, and today now OpenAI's uh, chat GPT is the thing that uh, everybody keeps, keeps looking at and using. Um, and it's pretty darn good. I'll, I'll have to admit, it's pretty darn good. And if you get a chance to use uh, Chat GPT and 4.0, 4 which is a paid thing, um, they've got some really, really great assistants. And one of them is making a slideshow. Uh, and so you can actually make slides using Chat GPT 4.0. Um, uh, Google's AlphaGo uh, 2016 was the uh, time when uh, they. Uh, which AI points to and says, ah, this is truly when machines are better because they, they beat the world's Go player, right? Um, really, it, it needs to be looked at in AI, and we're going to delve in now to the different roles that it plays um, because it, it really has enhanced our, our market share. So if you want to um, use it for your... Um, your, your contact maintenance, con con customer relationship manager, your CRM, 
Um, Salesforce.com is one of those companies that that has is the top of the game in doing that. Um, IBM still is doing predictive an analytics, and they are advertising this quite heavily. Um, and chatbots, again, OpenAI is the company that's that's uh, that's doing that. Um, on the profit side, if you want to look at um, automation um, in a manufacturing environment, uh, UiPath is one of those companies that takes uh, statistics and and uh, allows you to do that. Um, uh, we have a, a, a degree, right, which is industrial engineering. And that's basically what they do. They go through uh, your manufacturing path and try to optimize and, and get more out of each machine. Well, this is a, a group and a, and a software that uh, allows you to do that. So if any of you are into that kind of, uh, kind of environment. Um, some uh, dynamic pricing. Uh, pricing is an issue uh, with uh, when you're trying to to figure out uh, how you're going to make a profit. If you mess it up by, you know, a penny or two, I don't know how how many of you know how gasoline is priced, but it's priced every day. Um, uh, they they change the prices on a daily basis, and if they miss it by a penny, they they lose out uh, dramatically. And supply chain. Uh, this is an interesting uh, piece of information here. Here was one where uh, the um, the AI, the chat chat GPT said, oh, uh, supply chain auto optimization is done by Lamasoft. Uh, well, it turns out that uh, Lamasoft was purchased by uh, Coupa, and it was purchased by Coupa on, uh, in 2020. They paid $3.5 billion for for Lamasoft. Um, why? Why? Because they had a large amount of information and supply chain optimization is just that important. So we don't often think about what it takes to move stuff from point A to point B, but this was one of those cases. Um, security is a problem. Um, and as it's, it still continues to be a problem, um, the the companies that uh, that work in virus right and uh, and uh, malware those companies make their money off of uh, getting you to buy and to install that program. Well, Dark Trace is a company that works in immediate um, threat protection, and so uh, uh, companies that are trying to uh, hold on to their their information would use Dark Trace. Take a look at that if you don't have it. Um, obviously, uh, companies that deal with commerce like PayPal and Google are constantly looking at uh, security breaches and how to how to manage those. Um, streamlining the IT process, and uh, hopefully we're going to talk some more about that. Uh, Mark will talk about some of these companies, but Ansible is an open um, uh, source project. Um, it's uh, managed by Red Hat, so how much it, that involves uh, uh, stuff that's not um, um, not Linux based, I don't know. Uh, predictive maintenance, interesting. Uh, Cisco purchased them at, in the third quarter of 2024, and uh, it allows you to look at your entire network and to look for threats in your network, uh, as well as streamline your network. Uh, one of the things that uh, has been the downfall, I think, of of, in, of environments, networks, uh, and I see it here locally, um, is that we just don't have anybody that um, spends enough time looking at how the networks are work together. And so you need a tool, and uh, Splunk is one of those companies that provides it. And then uh, NLP tools, which is natural language processing. Um, and uh, take a look at that particular section, uh, natural language from Google. The uh, pivotal roles then for data insights because data is part of this whole whole deal. I mean, it is the whole deal. Um, exploratory analysis. Um, it, we want to uncover patterns and anomalies. And uh, so if you're working in the data market, 
uh, this is one of the tools and one of the areas that you can uh, create software for. Um, statistical analysis is one of the things that AI has done and done very well. Um, my daughter works in an in industry that had on 1%, 1% um, uh, uh, good parts. Uh, I can't remember what you call that, but 1% was all their, their, uh, their goodness was. But so she got it to 4% and they gave her all kinds of big bucks. But the way she did it was through statistical analysis. I helped her, of course. Uh, predictive analysis, forecasting future trends. This is kind of interesting because if you ask G GPT about a future event, um, sometimes the um, uh, it will tell you, I can't do that. It won't predict the future for you. So what does it do, though? And oh, I, I love this idea that it's going to base it on historical data. Uh, what do they tell you in the stock market, right? That the the future of this particular company is not predicted on on historical information. But we don't have really uh, we every day we do things based upon uh, historical data, don't we? Um, and uh, and so there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to predict the future. Um, I, I think they don't want to be sued. Anyways, uh, decision support. So the um, we need data, but we need somebody to gather the data. So uh, in my jobs that I've had, um, oftentimes they've said, "Well, Kim's one of those guys that you know can take a lot of data and bring it down to something where people can understand." And hopefully, this is a good example of that. Um, we're in a market here in North Carolina where. Uh, we have a lot of healthcare um, uh, providers, um, Duke and UNC, both uh, being uh, hospitals as well as as uh, uh, educational institutes. We also have a lot of drug research, drug and dr drug research companies. With Quintiles and Glaxo, Smith Klein are here, um, and so uh, there's a lot of the software and a lot of the software development that's here is is based around that kind of uh, those people. So healthcare also has changed because people like me have gotten older. I'm, you know, baby boomer. So uh, all the baby boomers getting old and they're getting feeble. Uh, and they, and they, we, we've got uh, some other things. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, scare was uh, something where we needed a lot of healthcare help. Um, so let's look at some of the applications that are there. One of the applications that uh, that we need a lot of help with is medical imaging. Um, unfortunately, there's a shortage of x-ray and MR, MRI, not technicians, but readers, uh, people to do that interpretation, because not only do you have to have your degree in, in uh, being a physician, but you also have to have some, some good technical capabilities. Well, you can imagine if there's a little white dot on the on a, on a picture and it means something about your health, you want to know about it. And uh, so rather than uh, have an individual try to pick those out, um, having an AI say, you might want to take a look at this dot that's right here. That's a good thing. So Nanox imaging, uh, again, one of those things where it was, uh, uh, it acquired Zebra medical vision, uh, which was the standard in the industry for this. One of the great things about it, we talk about data, is that um, they have an interesting library. They have 30 million patient records, 500 million images in a 10 year history. It's, a, uh, it's one of those, those great things. And they're trying to say, uh, okay, we've got, to, we've got that. Now we need to be able to share that with other people. And so they call it democratizing, democratizing the delivery of healthcare. So AI needs uh, these large amounts of data, and here's a company that has it. Um, ADOC and PATH AI are also a couple of companies that do that. Wearable devices. I've got the I got one of them watches, <laughs> you know, and my watch does everything. It does EKGs or EK. I wish, yeah, I wish it did it. Maybe it needs to do an EKG, but it does an ECG, right? It does electrocardiogram. Uh, and then it's big warning, right? Uh, if it says that it's bad, go to your doctor. Don't 
don't trust the device. Uh, Fitbit, uh, the, the blood pressure is the thing that a lot of these companies are trying to do. And uh, I bought this watch because I thought it was gonna give me uh, blood pressure. And as it turns out, um, blood pressure monitors are something that, that are now coming out that, uh, that you can wear separate. Um, uh, they even have the monitors now for measuring your um, um, blood levels. What do you call it? And instead of instead of pricking your finger, I can't remember what that's called. Uh, blood sugar, blood sugar, and so uh, they measure your blood sugar now electronically. So that'll be the next thing. Your watch will measure your blood sugar for you. I'm sure. Um, and then natural language processing and uh, Google. Uh, healthcare and IBM boss. I, I looked at that lang natural language processing and I thought, gee, what, what would they use AI for? And I said, well, they could use it to, to uh, read some of the technical documentation I got for, for, uh, for my, my lab work. I mean, if you ever read some of that stuff, it's like off the charts. They have their own vocabulary. So making it natural so that somebody can read those things is good. Um, drug discovery. So when we uh, had 2020 came along and all of a sudden we had a, a real problem with uh, drugs and, uh, and the path that it takes to get a drug, um, to get a, to get a drug. <laughs> My watch just told me it's time to get moving. <laughs> so um, anyways, uh, so drug repurposing, things like, um, um, I don't know if you, you remember, but there was a big deal about uh, the COVID-19 uh, and, and what drugs were we going to use. And somebody said, hey, there's a malaria drug out there that you could use. So drug repurposing, uh, benevolent AI, it's called. Um, predictive analysis. So um, sometimes you can, you can look into a drug. Uh, this was a fascinating company. It says, we, we know what we want to do. Uh, let's figure out what the drug interactions are going to be um, with other drugs that are already in the market. So it's a, it's a great help for them to at least get started with that. And then clinical trials. And because clinical trials are, are a big deal here, and as we talked about in 2020, where it's like, how can we accelerate clinical trials? Uh, this company called Tempest is working in that, that uh, area. All right, uh, predictive analysis. And as I said, uh, oftentimes the, the AI companies are not want to, to do prediction, but uh, here's a company that uh, identifies your risks. Um, I was told that I had diabetes type two. And I said, uh, and my doctor says, oh, you're gonna only live a year longer. That was 20 years ago. But uh, here's a company that, two companies that do patient risk identification. Doctors want to know this, that they're, so they're able to scare their patients, I guess. Uh, predictive maintenance of hospital equipment, uh, kind of off the charts and different from this. Siemens has got a ton of stuff on their website. If you go to this website, uh, health, health and health and ears, health and um, and take a look at some of this stuff. It's not just predicting maintenance of hospital equipment. They have got a lot of AI stuff out there. Um, personalized treatment plans. Again, once you have decided where you're, where you're going, uh, this company uh, really, we, we see this for cancer patients. And so a lot of cancer um, uh, progression and uh, where we're going, what do we do next? You know, what do we do next? What do we do next? Uh, flat iron is, has been key in doing that for cancer care. So those are, that's the, that's the hospital stuff. That's the hospital stuff. Now, what are we going to do about other stuff? Logic, uh, logical, logical transform, transformations. Um, logistics is a big key, is a big problem. Um, I had a friend that says, uh, you're, not, you're not concerned about uh, feeding people. I said, I said, well, there's a lot of people that, are, uh, that don't have any food. I said, but the problem is not that there isn't food to give them. The problem is they don't have the wherewithal to get to the food. 
And if you knew where they were and you could transport it to them, then that would be key. Uh, uh, Our church does a local food pantry. And uh, while that's wonderful, people still have to get to the food pantry um, to to get the food that's there. So uh, logistics means a lot. And uh, some of the systems that are out there now uh, are just starting to look at at how we can uh, provide those things and provide logistics. Um, Road automation, uh, I see Tesla car every day when I'm on the road. Uh, So they're ubiquitous with with artificial intelligence. When people say a car that has AI, they think of that. Sometimes they don't think about Waymo. Waymo has been in the business now probably longer than Tesla. And uh, when Waymo first started out, they, they, wanted to have a, a driverless Uber. Um, and they said, well, you know, it might be, uh, it might be easier to do that inner city, you know, take away from the cab companies. And uh, so they started out in San Francisco and uh, they in fact created a, um, uh, tried to, to do a driverless system there. And they said, oh, it's gonna be easy because we've got all these buildings and we can find it. Not so. Um, so uh, yeah, and we're going to give all these slides out at the end. So the the other part was um, they they looked at that and they started doing some of their experiments and they found out yeah it wasn't that easy. So one of the things that they did was they said oh we'll we'll uh, we're going to have to enhance it. So they have an enhanced city. So San Francisco now has got markers. For Waymo. So Waymo has been successful there. They did it in Phoenix then. And uh, soon they say it's going to be in Los Angeles and Austin. We'll see. John Deere and agriculture. Oh, my goodness. Uh, They're not the only agriculture company. Chase is another company that does a lot of the big tractors. But uh, John Deere is kind of, you know, that's their thing. And they thought, well, how can we help the farmer? And this is a farming uh, environment here in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm in Holly Springs, North Carolina. And uh, just down the road is tobacco and peanuts. Um, and last year was was uh, corn. But how do you harvest that um, for the uh, uh, and for these large, large acre places? And uh, you only have a certain amount of time that you can harvest it. We, it would be great if we could do that at night. And of course, some of them do do that at night. Um, and so, uh, and there's only so many people that do it. So let's create a machine that's a, called an autonomous tractor. So they actually have an autonomous tractor. Um, and they have large machines that are autonomous at this point. And they work by GPS and they work by, um, and they actually have, some of them have uh, drones that help them. Um, fascinating, fascinating. I mean, I've been to several uh, seminars and talking about uh, AI and use um, with agriculture. Uh, drones, again, drones are a big deal. Um, I was going to bring my drone. I had have a drone that I bought, a little, little tiny drone, and it was back in the day trying to make it work, and you had to trim this and trim that and do this and that to make it work and make it fly well. Um, and, uh, and it would always hit things, right? So today's drones, uh, DJI is is key in that entertainment drones, but they also have some higher end drones that are used for the real estate market. Um, and take a look at DJI. Um, the, at the upper end though, when you're starting to look at um, um, the uh, police and uh, emergency um, fire protection, they've got some, some robots now that actually carry uh, uh, some amount uh, of, uh, of the hoses and whatnot so that they can put fires out with fascinating stuff. And also see robots. So AI is being used there. Um, it, it, unless you're involved in the software that's used inside of those, it's hard for you to, to recognize um, uh, how much AI means to them. Again, if you were doing it by hand, trying to make it work, um, you see uh, the wind has something to do with it and where you are has something to do with it and collision control. And if you had a camera on it, it could see it, but it has to see in four. I mean, it's 
amazing uh, how much AI is means to those devices. The big problem right now is battery. The battery life is not enough for them to do much with. Ground robots, Boston Dynamics is the company that you want to talk about. If you see those dogs, you know, that uh, mechanical dog robots, that's Boston Dynamics. Surgical, if you have ever had surgery with uh, Da Vinci, the Da Vinci robots, uh, they have multiple little tasks on them. Go to that website, uh, intuitive.com, and you'll see the Da Vinci robots. Um, fascinating what they do with surgery. And then, of course, Amazon talks about using drones, right, to deliver products. Uh, it's limited and really limited because of the um, by the the uh, amount of um, uh, amount of battery life. Yeah. All right. So, moving on, customer service. So, one of the things that uh, that it can help us with is also. Uh, I call it the wake up words, right? The wake up words for, for, um, I won't, I won't say that because you might have a phone that, that'll wake up if I use those words, but you see those words on the screen. Whoop, whoop, whoop. What did I do? Hold on. Eric, I, I, my, when I roll my mouse, it does that. So, um, and I need AI for the presentation. So, um, uh, assistant.google.com, if you've ever looked at that, that's their AI background. So take a look at that. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, Watson has been there for IBM. And so if you go to their their website, you'll see that. Uh, and chat, uh, open AI. Interestingly enough, let's see, uh, uh, open AI, Microsoft told Recode. So this is kind of kind of backdoor stuff. It was not disclosing the deal specifics, but Semaphore reported two weeks ago that the two companies were talking about ten billion dollars. So, so uh, Microsoft getting seventy five percent of OpenAI's profits until it recoups its investment. I'm reading from their website. After which it would have a forty nine percent stake in the company. So Chat GPT is that powerful and that that important that Microsoft is buying a pretty good share in it. Um, another one down here, e-commerce. So um, talked about uh, uh, Amazon obviously has got a retail area and uh, that name that I won't mention because I got it all over my house and it'll, it'll uh, say what? Um, and then uh, Bowl 360, another one of those purchases, it was purchased by Genesis um, in um, 2021. And it does conversational AI, dynamic knowledge base, and it has intuitive agent experience. So you might want to take a look at that if you're in the e-commerce um, area. Scientific discovery. Very first one on there, MATLAB. If it wasn't for MATLAB and Simulink, um, the math math that's used for artificial intelligence, at least uh, when it comes to natural language, chat GPT, uh, uses a lot of that math uh, for statistical and probabilities. Uh, take a look at that website if you're interested in the insides of it, um, if you're interested in learning about deep learning, that's where to go. Um, and ComSol, uh, deals with multi-physics. I had to look this up. Multi-physics software is what they provide. What does that mean? I still don't know. I'm going to look into that some more. But it says, uh, the, the, the description says, the simultaneous simulation of different aspects of a physical system or systems and the interactions among them. I guess that would be like football or something. Um, so uh, material discovery and design. Uh, we're talking about the large base of, of material information. Again, in order for AI to work, it has to have a large base of information and tagged information. So these are a couple of different places where you can go against Lawrence Ber Berkeley National Laboratory. You can imagine the materialsproject.org. And these .org companies, typically it's open 
um, in order for us to use it, right? It has to be open. So if you're doing materials and if you have mater materials programs or you're in the material space, uh, these are two areas where you really want to go to these websites and look at these. They're open source too. All right. So we're ready to talk about ethics. Uh, Dave and I are going to do uh, an AI ethics responsibilities and governments, governance on Tuesday on 11.14, also at noon. So it'll be a, a one-hour attempt to, uh, to talk about governance. But we're going to make a quick stab at it here in one slide. So first of all is uh, bias, bias detection and fairness. Um, interestingly enough, um, there are several bias detectors. So if you were programming this, if you were programming bias, in your AI, you would not want to know about the Thiel index, the Euclidean distance, the Manhattan distance, and the Malanobis distance, and others. Um, if you go to ai-fairness-360-org, right, that is from, from Linux, um, it used to be IBM. IBM had, this was another one where the, the AI failed me. When I went to their website, it was not there. They said, oh yeah, that's been in the Linux Foundation. It's been with the Linux Foundation since, uh, let me see my notes. I don't know. Oh, let's see this on the other page. Nope, nope. Don't know. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, oh, July 2020. It's the first line on my notes. July 2020. So they they bought uh, or they they gave, I guess, uh, all of their source to uh, to the Linux Foundation. So you go to that website there. That's on there. Um, fairness indicators. Really uh, um, fascinating website to go to and talk about TensorFlow and where they. They give you these indicators that I just mentioned, the Thiel, the Euclidean, Manhattan, blah, blah, blah. And they show you how to put those into your, into your AI, into your AI programming. Um, privacy protection. Uh, uh, many companies have tried to do that. The uh, uh, two-layer um, where they dial your phone and you got to put a number in privacy. Apple actually on their website right there, we're talking about privacy features. They mention all the areas that they've had to address. And so you can imagine if you've got a browser, right? Uh, we see this now with a little thing that comes up and says, uh, do you want us to do you want us to uh, to give you cookies? And uh, no cookies, half a cookie, <laughs> chocolate chip only. Um, maps, uh, we, we don't really think about that as privacy, but if you are going to uh, going to different places, um, your system already knows where you are. I, I used it actually in a court case to say I wasn't there. Uh, you know, my map on my phone says I wasn't there. Um, photos, uh, trying to, to address the idea of children shouldn't be shown in photos uh, without their, their consent and some issues associated with that. Um, uh, FaceTime. So if you're doing FaceTime, um, you know, see real world, they can see behind you and all of privacy issues, messages, email, uh, the, that other wake up word, Siri, right? S-I-R-I, -I, you know, that word, uh, the wallet, Apple Pay, Apple Card, right? All of those they've got some real issues with, but you can imagine that's just in your phone, just in your phone. Um, an interesting thing by Microsoft, homomorphic, homomorphic encryption. I had no idea what that meant. Um, they they don't know yet either. Um, if you can go to this, it's a it's a research publication that they produced, and one of the interesting um, results, I guess, out of this group was they say that. Um, uh, in order to protect it, it has to be standardized. So if you're going to put rules in, they have to be they have to be rules that are standardized across all of the data. So I don't know. 
It says most likely by multiple standardization bodies and government agencies. Um, an important part of standardization is broad agreement on security levels for varying parameter sets. So, wow, that's that's like blows my mind as to what, what's going to happen there or how that's going to happen. And then finally, transparency. So um, uh, open AI, again, being one of the, the uh, 500 pound gorillas in the in the market. Um, they're, they have a charter, and on their charter, they say, yeah, we're concerned about it, and we're, it's a competitive race, and, uh, you know, if you want to do it, uh, we'll be better than, better than ever. We'll work out specifics in case-by-case -case agreements and blah, blah, blah. So uh, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a broad brush, yeah, we're going to do something about it, but they really don't say how. Um, and then again, another organization that you can belong to, partnershiponai.org, is a is an, a nonprofit uh, community, and it's got everybody: academic, civil, social, industry, media, everybody. So you can go join that. Um, this brings up another a really good end uh, uh, question, which is: Okay, so everything's going to change. Uh, where do I fit in? I, I just lost my job. I was talking with a couple of guys uh, on Tuesday night about um, they're losing their job in the software industry. Uh, they're losing their job in the network industry. They're losing their job in a lot of the what we thought were solid jobs. And the question uh, really is, now what do we do? Um, it's kind of the uh, people that were making buggies when the car came along. You know, now what do we do? It's almost that uh, that mind blowing. Well, soft dead. Thank you, David, uh, has stepped up to the plate and starting in November, the first uh, November 28th through 30th, Mark is going to do AI for business analysis. And I assume we're going to do one for project management at some point. Um, so uh, uh, this there's uh, three of these sessions, uh, December 12th through 14th and January 30th through through February the 1st. And so you can go to the Soft AI uh, or Soft Ed uh, website, take a look at that. And of course, hopefully we'll have some uh, on AI coming up. And we've got uh, the second one coming up in December, I guess. Um, uh, you can go to Coursera. Uh, they've got a huge range of courses that are there. I took one. Uh, it was almost over my head, and I have a degree in math, uh, as well as electrical engineering. <laughs> it was over my head to some degree. I had to go back and almost didn't make the test. I did almost flunk the test. <laughs> it's a good thing they give you a second chance at it. Um, and then LinkedIn, of course, trying to uh, re-educate people in the marketplace. I'm not quite sure how much that is has got AI in it. I looked at that and I didn't see much in there. Um, skill assessment and tracking. Um, so here's a couple of companies that do that. They look at your technical skills. They they kind of point you in in a way to get some more skills. Um, and then career path, um, the Nano degree and Future Learn. Both of those companies are involved in career pathways. And so if you're a young person, uh, it might be, might be good to look at that. I don't know how much of that AI is involved in there. So I just looked at them briefly and uh, didn't go down very far in that. All right. So what's the future look like? Well, uncharted. We're on uncharted territories. We're not quite sure where AI is going to take us. Um, it's obviously going to incorporate, incorporate AI in just about everything that we've got. So even those that we don't even know what they are. And it has a potential to self-improve and maybe create Life 3.0, another book that was an interesting book for me to read. Um, so that's saying beyond right human intelligence and into AI. And we see a lot of, uh, we, we watch them all the time, the science fiction, because I'm interested in this. What is What do the artists think about science fiction and AI and, and what does it mean? So, um, so, but there are some limitations. Yes, there are some limitations to AI. 
The first one is it's data dependent. Uh, doesn't make its own data. However, there was a study that said that if uh, the the data that we have, right, will be more more data than we can consume, and much of it will be created by AI. So if AI is creating AI, which creates AI, which creates AI, what does that what does that mean? And so there was a recent study, and I don't have it down here, but uh, uh, just read it recently that talked about how that that kind of pollutes the uh, the actual information that's coming out. So, and also as it says here, we got some privacy things that we need to to uh, to address. Ethical, same thing, right? Uh, the potential bias has been there in the net. Uh, if we're using the net to generate um, uh, uh, presentations and and other things, there's a potential that uh, it's not going to be fair. So how do we ensure fairness in an AI integrated world? And I mentioned it before, Brave New World. And if you don't know those those uh, uh, books, Brave New World and um, uh, 1984, which is which I think is funny. That's the title of the book. Um, interpretability, interpretability. Um, a lot of the models are, yeah, you just you plug this in and you just call this. And while that's nice, it's a, it's a black box. You don't really know what you're getting out there. So there's, there is a rising demand for explainable AI. And so I've got a, another one of these webinars coming up, uh, believe it or not, on um, October the 31st. That's, that's, uh, that's Halloween. So I'll be here at noontime and Halloween. And then I'm going to dress up in my, Oh, uh, uh, Iron Man costume <laughs> for for for, uh, for Halloween. So um, there's some some need for that. And unfortunately, um, there's not enough data. Most of the data that we have out there is generalized. There were several places where it's not. The materials one is super. The uh, the patients one is fine. Um, uh, if you go from system to system, like here in town, if you go to the UNC system and then you got to go to the Duke system, um, they have the capability to move some data, but sometimes they don't and you have to transport it. So uh, we need some robustness in that capability to to move from one to the other. And again, it says uh, some places we just don't have enough information. All right. Um, wow, we've we've got. Uh, significant con computational resources for training today. Yes, we do, but we need to have sustainable AI research. The research is there, just not enough. Um, we've got, uh, uh, there's no emotion in this. Uh, I, I put down data and Spock, right? You know, uh, oftentimes they'd say, oh, we're all gonna die. And, and uh, Captain Kirk says, yeah, we're going to do it anyhow. You know, <laughs> you know uh, got to save that person, save the last person. So we got to have uh, uh, AI that's got emotional recognition. I um, don't know about that. The, uh, it's still out for me here. And security concerns, absolutely. Uh, what if we got smart uh, uh, robbers? Huh? Yeah, we give, we give AI to the to the to the hackers and to the robbers. Now we've got some other issue we need to address. And then finally, the generalization of AI. So again, the, the more you make it like a an individual and like a, like a human, thinking like a human, making decisions like a human, the more we get to this thing that they call general intelligence. And when you get to general intelligence, if it gets bigger, better than the human, this is why these books, The Singularity and uh, Life 3.0, and I've got another one, AI Superpowers in China, uh, you know, that, uh, that we're concerned about. All right, I'm going to open it up. How'd we do, Dave? 1257, that looks good. Um, some questions that were, were brought up. You're on. I'm looking at the chat. Robert says, uh, ethical concerns is huge for me uh, now that he's in the job market. Well, yep. 
uh, Tawana says she bought an Insta 360 Flow smartphone gimbal. Any other questions? All right, we're just at the at the done point here. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for you joining with me. Um, and I appreciate and hope to see you again. Uh, next time for me is going to be Halloween. Maybe I'll maybe I'll dress up in my suit for that. <laughs>